uh, this, e this morning, this evening, this morning, I'm going to be reading from First Chronicles in the Old Testament, chapter 21. And we've been talking about altars, and uh, this morning I have, to, I have to do some explanation before we get to what I really want to talk about, because there's a story here in First Chronicles that deals with uh, King David. It was toward the end of his life, and he uh, had done something. You know, there were two great sins in King David's life. The first one was, of course, his sin with Bathsheba, uh, adultery and murder. But this, this second one was toward the end of his life, and it's perhaps uh, more poignant because the results of it, what we'll see as we read through God's Word. But it's, it's necessary that I do some explanation, okay? And sometimes that gets a little boring. I don't want to put anybody to sleep, okay? But I mean, just so, just so you understand what's going on, in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, in verse 1, it says this. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, Satan provoked David to take a census. That's what that means, take a census. How many people know every 10 years in the United States of America, there's a census that's taken. They count how many people they are and where they live. And that way, when they, you know, they know where all the tax money is going to come from, okay? So they want to keep track of everybody, and that and it has to do with the House of Representatives and all that. But in Israel, ancient Israel, there were times when God told Moses to count the people, uh, so they found out how many warriors they had, how many people were there in, in each and every tribe. The book of Numbers, if you read the book of Numbers, there's a part, parts where it's just like tells you how many people are in each tribe. And that's one of those places where you kind of skim over real quick because there's nothing really. But anyway, David was provoked by Satan to take a census. Now, if you put your finger there, there's a, there's a parallel passage to this. And we're going to come back here, but I want you to turn with me over to 2 Samuel. I have to put a mark in my Bible. 2 Samuel, chapter 24, okay, where it says this. It says, and again, I'll give you a chance for those of you who are turning pages. Somebody yelled at me for not giving people enough time to... It says, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Now, the first thing when you read this, you're going to say, wait a minute. Over in Chronicles, it was Satan that provoked David. And here it says, the Lord was angry against who? Against Israel, and he provoked David. Or he moved David. Now a lot of folks will say, that, will read that and say, you see? You see, you can't believe what this says. But it needs some explanation. It needs some explanation. There are certain parts of Scripture that need some explanation. And this is one of them. Because if you don't really know what's going on here, you would say, well, wait a minute, I don't understand. Well, I'm going to explain it to you this morning. And this really isn't what this message is about, but it, I have to do it to get to where I want to go. You know, you've got to drive through, uh, you know, Iowa to get to... Nebraska. So we, we have to go this way, all right? It says here that, again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Not against David, but against Israel. Now, why would God get mad at Israel? We're not given details here. But we can glean things from the other parts of Scripture. Whatever, whatever made God mad at Israel? Well, there was idolatry and pride. When the nation began to turn its back on God, either to worship other idols, or when they began to feel that they were self-sufficient, there were times in the Bible when God got angry with Israel, when they desired a king. You remember way back in 1 Samuel, they said, we want a king. And Samuel said, why do you want a king for? You got God. They said, well, we had to have an earthly king. God was upset. When they would fall into idolatry, God would get upset. So God, again, it says, again, God was angry with Israel. It doesn't give us the specific uh, offense, but we can pretty much 
assume that Israel was turning their back on God. And their king, David, who was the king, was probably leading the way. This is toward the end of his life. He had been through a lot. He'd been a great king. Israel was powerful. They were well respected among all the nations in the land. They had, they had garnered great victories. So they probably started feeling pretty good about themselves. Invincible. How many people know you're only as invincible as God's hand is upon you? If God removes his hand, anything can happen. That's why when we read here when it says that the Lord moved David against them to say, go number Israel. God doesn't cause anybody to sin, but what he does is, and he's done this many times in the scriptures, he'll take his hand off and he'll allow Satan to have his way. He did it with Job. He did it, if you read Peter, on the night that he was, uh, you know, Jesus was betrayed. Peter said, I'll never leave you, I'll fight and I'll, I'll die for you. And Jesus said, Peter, Satan has desired to have you, to sift you as wheat. And I pray for you that your faith doesn't fail. In other words, God let Satan have a crack at Peter. Because God knew Jesus prayed that his faith wouldn't fail. And his faith wouldn't. Sometimes God does that. Sometimes he can take his hand off of you. If you're disobedient or if you start getting out of his will or start... Well, I believe that's what was happening with Israel at this time. That God removed his hand because they started to get prideful. And we're going to see as we read, as we go back to 1 Chronicles, we're going to see exactly what was going on here. You know, the United States, a lot of people who live in the United States think we're the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Great army, great resources. Just took a handful of guys and four jets to tear the place up about ten years ago. Didn't take an atomic bomb or any great army. If God takes his hand off, believe me, Satan can have his way. And it's always for the purpose. God always has a purpose and a reason for allowing that to happen when he does. Now let's go back to First Chronicles again. And chapter 21. I hope I've explained that so you understand. Because a lot of people read that and they'll scratch their head and they'll say, wait a minute. Okay. Okay. Satan stood up against Israel in verse 1 and provoked David to number Israel. Has Satan ever provoke you? <laughs> okay. He's good at that, isn't he? All right. And David said to Joab, who was his chief general. And again, if you know anything about the Old Testament or the stories concerning David, Joab was he was kind of like a, a sort of like a really strange character. He was very loyal to David. He was a loyal general, but he was he was wicked. I mean, he would kill he would kill you at the drop of a hat if he thought you were trying to mess with his territory. Okay, he was he was a tough guy. He said, Joab. He says to uh, to Joab and the rulers of the people in verse two. Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab said, The Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be, but my lord the king, are they not all the, my lord's servants? Why then does my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? See, even Joab knew. It wasn't wrong to take a census, but what was wrong is why he was taking the census. It was a pride thing. He wanted to count how many soldiers he had. He wanted to be able to say, look at this great army I have. I'm King David. Nevertheless, it says in verse 4, the king's word prevailed, because king's words usually do prevail. Wherefore, Joab departed and went through all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David, and they all, all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. And Judah was four hundred threescore and ten thousand men that drew sword. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. In other words, Joab didn't even, didn't even do a complete job. He knew it was trouble. And it says in verse 7, And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore, he smote Israel. You see, God was angry with Israel, and he caused, he allowed, he took his hand off, he allowed the hand of Satan to move, and now he had an opportunity to send judgment. Now, this is just setting up the message this morning. I'm just, I'm just trying to help you understand where we're at. It's a context thing, all right? Now, David said to God in verse 8, 
I've sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. It says in, in, over there, if you read the parallel passage, that David delighted in hearing about all the men he had, and he realized that it was sin. Okay. You know, when we start to think that we preserve ourselves, when we start to think that we're in charge, when we start to think that we're the reason why we are where we are, it's a dangerous place to be. When we stop realizing that anything we are, anything we have, anything we do, any talent, any blessing, anything we got comes from Him. And He can give it and take it like that. Okay, now. It says in verse 9, here we go. And the Lord spoke unto Gad, David's seer, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer thee three things. Take your pick, David. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus says the Lord, Choose thee, either three years of famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtakes thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again. Should you want to fall into the hands of nature, three years of famine and drought? Or do you want to fall into the hands of men where for three months your, your enemies will pursue you? Or do you want to put it in my hand for three days? David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. You see, King David, as, as many times as he did things that were not legal, as, as many sins as he committed, he always knew where his hope was. Even at this point where he, was, where he sinned and where he turned his back on God and was prideful, even at this point, King David recognized that his only hope was to fall into the hands of a, of a loving, merciful God. When he wrote the 51st Psalm, after being caught in his first sin, when he wrote that 51st Psalm, he said, you know what, you have every right to wipe me off the face of the earth. But he put himself in God's mercy. He put himself in God's hands. How many people know that? There's no better place to be than in God's hands. The, 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 it might be severe, but listen, God is a God of mercy. Man doesn't have mercy. He says, Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Now, you get the picture of where we're at. You see what's going on here. You see where we're at. King David sinned. It was a sin of pride and vanity. The nation of Israel was sinning, and God allowed David to sin to bring judgment upon the nation of Israel. So here we are. It says in verse 14, So the Lord set pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. As he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed it, It's enough. Stay now your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. If you read it in 2 Samuel, they'll use the word Aruna. It's just a different, different vowels in the name. It's the same guy. He was on the threshing floor. You know where the threshing floor is? Anybody here know anything about farming? I don't know anything about farming other than what I've read. I'm not a farmer. Green Acres ain't the place for me, okay? I'm not, I'm, you know, I've, I've, I've known people who are farmers, and God bless them. They're great people, but I'm, I'm not a farmer. But what they would do, they, they, would, they would harvest the barley and harvest wheat. And, and what they would do is they would take, they didn't have machinery like we have today that kind of separates. They would have to separate the wheat from the chaff. So they would take the bundles of wheat and they would, they would go to a place with a hardened floor and they would beat them on the floor like this until everything would be separated. And then they would be able to take it and put it in a cloth and throw it up in the air and the wind would blow the chaff away. And all the good stuff would, would fall down. So they were there on the threshing floor. 
beating wheat, beating, beating grain. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor in verse 16. And David lifted up his eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword. Man, the sword of judgment. God allowed him to see what was hovering over Jerusalem. Oh, that God would allow us to see stuff that's hovering over our nation today. And stuff that's hovering over our world today. That, we, that God would allow us to see the hand of judgment just waiting. That God would allow us to see the hand of judgment over our lives. Sometimes we're blind to that. says, David, in verse 16, lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. Man, they were, they were, they were fasting and praying and seeking God. And David said unto God, is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that they have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on the people that they should be placed. See, David was, he was a man after God's own heart. He might have done some stupid things, but he always knew where his mercy was going to come from. And he stood for the people as the king. Now listen, here we go. Verse 18. All that to get here. Okay. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad, who was the prophet, to say to David that David should go up and set up a what? An altar. Remember what we said about altars? I've been, I've been beaten. All, I've been talking about altars. A place where we worship. A place where we sacrifice. A place where we encounter God. And a place of remembrance. The angel of the Lord said, go set up an altar. Unto the Lord. In the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spoke in the name of the Lord. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him. Hid, hid themselves. Interesting, and this is just a little, so I always say this when they talk about angels. Please, when we talk about angels in the Bible, we're not talking about little girls with wings. <laughs> angels in the Bible were fierce warriors. When people saw them, they fell down. When people saw them, they got scared because angels were mighty, flaming. I mean, they were just So it's not like the little, <laughs> okay, you know how that is. All right. It says, verse 22, Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said to David, Hey, take it. It's yours. Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give you the oxen also for the burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat, and uh, for the meal offerings. I give it all. And King David said, no, this has to cost me something. I'm not taking it for nothing. This got to cost me something. I want to tell you something. You build an altar unto the Lord, it's going to cost you something. There's some folks that they want to get right with God, but they don't want to give nothing up. They're not willing to change. They don't, want to, they don't want anything to change in their lives. They just want to go on doing what they're doing and be able to say, yeah, God's my friend. Listen, it's going to cost you something. Our brother read it here from Titus. The grace of God teaches us to live soberly and righteously. David said, I've got to pay. He said in verse 24, no, but I will verily buy it from, for the full price, for I will not take that which is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So David gave the ornaments for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered peace offerings and burnt offerings and called upon the Lord and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar, burnt offering, worship, sacrifice and communion with God. 
an encounter with God. A one-on-one -on -one encounter with the creator of the universe. And not only was there an encounter, and not only was there worship and sacrifice, but there's remembrance. Because if you read on, it says, The Lord commanded the angel when he put up his sword again under the sheath thereof. Verse 28. At that time when David saw the Lord, saw that the Lord had answered him in the threshing floor of Ornan, then he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord which Moses made in the wilderness and the altar of the burnt offering were at that season at the high place of Gibeon. But David could not go before to inquire of God, for he was afraid because of the sword of the angel of the Lord. Then David said in chapter 22, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering. That place where he made that altar became the temple mount. Became the place where Solomon built the temple. Became the place that today is the hottest piece of property on the face of the earth. Right there in the, the very same place that God stayed his hand when David made an altar. When they experienced his mercy. That very same place. You know what? It was the same place where Abraham offered his son Isaac. And God provided the lamb. The same place. See... The place, when, when Abraham built that altar, he called it Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. And as David made that offerings and sacrifice and thanked God for his mercy, for staying his hand of destruction, he told his son Solomon, build the temple right here. Because this is the place where God has provided. Now, we're talking about altars. Okay. This is Old Testament. Somebody said, well, how does that apply to me? I always love when I read something out of the Old Testament, I like to bring it to the New. Okay, and I want you to turn with me over to the book of Hebrews. We've been in the Hebrews a lot lately. And chapter 4. We were there a couple weeks ago. We'll go there again. Hebrews chapter 4. And... Uh, We'll start with verse. We'll start with verse nine. I like I like to start from the very beginning, but it's like so much. But verse nine, the the uh, the writer of this letter to the Hebrews was trying to convince Jews not to go back to Judaism, not to go back to the to the to the uh, offerings and sacrifices because Jesus had fulfilled all that. Okay. And he's trying to convince them that they don't have to go back to all the observances of the, of the, of the uh, Old Testament law. And he says in verse 9, there remains therefore a rest to the people of God. Thank God we, we have a rest that we're looking forward to. Man, sometimes I just need a rest. I need a rest from all the stuff that's going on. I need a rest. Man, I hate election years. <laughs> don't you? I need a rest from all the screaming and bickering and name calling. I, I need a rest. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. You know, King David got in trouble because he was so proud of the army that he had built up. He was so proud of how, how great his nation was and how powerful they were. But God had to get him to a place where he had to realize that all that stuff that he had done wasn't worth nothing if it wasn't for God's hand. That God can take his hand off you and everything you ever had will turn to dust and turn to nothing. It says, for he that has entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works. And have you, listen, are you, are you still trying to work your way into heaven? Are you still trying to work your way into God's grace? So many people do it. I'll tell you what, I've, this, this last couple of days, I've talked to so many people who was telling me about their religion. Huh. I tried to tell them, look, you know, your religion is not worth a hill of beans. It's not worth nothing. I can stand before God and, and say, well, Lord, I was a preacher, and he'll just cry and say, get, get out of here. Ain't interested. Well, Lord, I gave, I tithed, I've been tithing for years. He said, get out of here. Doesn't mean nothing. 
When I stand in front of God, the only thing that's going to mean anything is the blood of Jesus covering me. That bloody garment. Okay. He says, For he that has entered into his rest has also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now here we go. For the word of God is what? Quick or alive. God's word is alive. The Bible is a living word. It's not just a bunch of words printed on a piece of paper. It's not a novel. It's not a biography. But it's power to change a life. It's alive. It's powerful. And sharper than what? Any two-edged, sharper than a sword that that angel held over Jerusalem. What's it do? It pierces even to the dividing of the soul and spirit. God's word will get to the very depth of your soul and examine everything you've ever done and everything you ever said and everything you ever thought. It'll examine every agenda. God's word, man, if you get into God's word, it's going to get into you. And it'll start cutting you up. God's word will bring judgment to your soul. He says it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents. Man, God knows why you're doing what you're doing. You might have everybody fooled. We, had a, we used to have a teacher. He would say, you can't buffalo me. <laughs> you might think you've got a few folks buffalo, but you're not going to buffalo him. His word looks at every, every thought, every notion, every agenda, every offense. He hears everything. Even when you think you're talking to yourself, God hears it. Everything. And his word examines. He's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Man, I, I try to keep this in my mind. When I start thinking things, I say, God, nobody else knows what I'm thinking, but you do. When I start wrestling with stuff going on, and I start thinking, come on, we've, we've, we've all done it. You know, you load up like you want to you say something to somebody. <laughs> And you get, you get ready to say to him, come on, you know what I'm talking about. It's like loading up the old rifle, ready to go. Next time I see him, I'm going to... See, God knows all that stuff. See, I think, I think the ones chuckling are the ones that really know what I'm talking about. I think you all know what I'm talking about. Somebody does you wrong, we load up. You know, on the outside, we're like this, but on the inside, we're like, mm. <laughs> maybe just me. It's a discerner, God's word, that sharp two-edged sword. Listen, I'll tell you something. When David came face to face with that angel, man, every, everything else fell away. Everything else, all, everything else departed. There was only one thing, him and that angel, ju him and judgment. And that's the way we are. When we come to our altar, it's us and judgment. Nobody in between, nobody to blame, nobody to point a finger at. It's us and God. And that sword that starts cutting us on the inside. He says, It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature in the deepest, darkest part of the ocean that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Man, God sees every and hears everything. We need to remind ourselves of that. We need to, we need to make that, we need to put that word. People talk about confessing God's word. We need to start confessing that word because there's nothing that gets by him. There's nothing that gets by him. Look what he says. We read this a few weeks ago. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. A great high priest. Who's that? Jesus. 
He's passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. David stood on that mountain and he saw that angel with that sword stretched out over Jerusalem. And the elders of Israel were with him and they saw that sword and they, and they shook. This wasn't buddy-buddy time with God. I want to tell you something. The people in this nation, we need to start looking and see. We need to pray that God would show us the hand of God over our nation right now. We need to pray that God would show us the hand of God over our families right now. Over our schools, over our churches. The sword of the Lord is there. He's getting ready to start dividing. He's getting ready to start cutting. He's getting ready to start cleansing his sanctuary. He's getting ready to start judgment beginning at the house of God. It already has. He's getting ready. Are you ready? Are you ready for him? Have you surrendered your life to him? Have you faced, have you, have you come face to face with God and face to face with your sin and face to face with your iniquity like David had to? You see that sword hovering over I'm going to tell you this morning, I thank God we have a God of mercy. In his mercy, he shows us our faults. In his mercy, he lets us see the wickedness that's in our hearts. In his mercy, he reaches out. Sometimes he might take his hand off us and, and allow Satan to buffet us. You know, the Apostle Paul said, that he had a, a thorn in his side, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. That's the Apostle Paul. How many people know what I'm talking about? He said he prayed three times. He said, God, take this thing out of me. And God said, listen, my grace is sufficient for you. God's mercy. Paul said that he was given that messenger of Satan. You know why he was given that? To keep him from getting too puffed up. To keep him from getting proud and arrogant. I want to ask you this morning, have you built an altar on your threshing floor? You know, sometimes, man, we get beat around like a stalk of wheat. We get sifted like wheat, it says in the Word. But Jesus has prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. I want to ask you this morning, we're going to close. I want to ask you this morning, have you built your altar on your threshing floor? Have you built the altar at the place where God has showed you his mercy this morning? It's important. It's important. Because when we go out and face that world out there, there's no mercy out there. Satan has no mercy. But God has mercy. When he begins to cut with that sword, it's not to hurt you. It's to make you more like his son, Jesus. I want to ask you if you're ready this morning. If you're ready this morning. Have you been born again? Have you been to the altar? Maybe it's been a long time since you've been to that altar. Maybe, it's, maybe, maybe, you've, been, maybe you've been playing a game and, and being proud of yourself and, and counting, uh, taking the senses and, and taking account of what a great, great life you've lived. God wants to let you know it, it, it hasn't been so great. I think of that story Jesus told about the man, I think it's in Luke chapter 17 or 16 somewhere, about the farmer that had big barns. And he said, man, he says, man, I've been, I've been growing all kinds of good stuff. I've got to build bigger barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. You know, when I get, when I get all this stuff done, I'm going to kick back and retire and say, oh, look what all the great things my hands have done. Jesus said, you fool, this night your soul is going to be re required of you. Never lived long enough to enjoy it. How many of us get caught up in that? Man, I'm going to build a bigger, I'm going to build better, I want more. Well, look what I've done. What a, I'm a self-made man. Successful. Made good investments. 
I haven't made good investments. <laughs> I made good investments, man. I got, wow, look, man, I, was, I really, boy, I did good here. When the sword comes. See, David had all that stuff too. But when the sword comes, it's not worth anything. The only thing that matters, the only thing that matters is a heart that's in tune with his. The only thing that matters is being covered, just like Adam and Eve had to be covered with those skins in the Garden of Eden. We've got to be covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. He's our covering. We can't make one for ourselves. He's the only way. Be sure you know Christ is your Savior. And I want to challenge you this morning to put foremost in your thinking that God is hearing every word, seeing every thought, every imagination. See, God's word is cutting. It might be cutting a little bit this morning. You can't fool God. You might get away with it for a while. You can learn how to play the game. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever play a game with God? You might learn how to play the game. And maybe even look like you're winning for a little while. But when God takes his hand off, you'll find out. I want to ask you this morning, we're going to play and pray, close in prayer. Have you built your altar on your threshing floor? Does it feel like the world's been beating you up? Maybe you need to build an altar. If you feel like you've been on a threshing floor, like you've been sifted like wheat, maybe you need to build an altar this morning. Not an altar to me, not the church of God, an altar to Him. And bring yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Maybe that's a solution. Maybe you don't need to watch the, the, the psycho shows on TV. Maybe you don't need the books from the, the self-help section. of the, Maybe you just need to build an altar and take a good look at yourself in the mirror of God's Word. Me too. Maybe that threshing, maybe that sifting is for the purpose of getting you to cry out, Oh God, what is going on? How many people, God, what's going on? You ever say that? If you really want to know, he'll tell you. <laughs> Sometimes we say, sorry, I asked. <laughs> How many people want to know? I want to be right with God. I want things right with my God. I don't care what he does. I don't care where I end up. I don't care if I'm rich or poor, if I preach or turn away. I don't care. I just want to be right with God. I want to be able to stand in front of him someday and have him say, come on in. I want to be able to stand in front of him someday and have him open up the book and say, there's his name. The book of life. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? See, that's the question. It's not your religion. It's not how good you've been. Or how good you can't be. It's the blood of Jesus. Won't you stand with me, please? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to be right. You want to be right with God? How do people want to be right with God? I want things right with Him. I want things right with Him. I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what I cut or don't have. I want to be right with Him. I just want to be right with Him. God, I pray you would, all pride, I pray, Lord, that pride would begin to cease in our lives. Lord, help us Take a good, hard look at who we are in the light of your word. God, those of us who feel pretty good about ourselves, God, maybe we need to stop and take a look at who we are. The Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that cares about their sin in their own flesh. We're all lost, dying sinners, and we need to be covered with the blood. Lord, I pray this morning that every one of us would look at ourselves 
in the light of your word. Say, God, wash me in the blood of Jesus Christ. God, cleanse me and make me whole. Make me a new creature. I'm tired of being my old self. I'm tired of being what I was. Lord, I want to be new. I'm tired of the people I've been hanging with. I'm tired about the stuff that I've been doing. I'm tired about the thoughts I've been thinking. Lord, I can't, I can't overcome it. I can't overcome my addiction. I can't overcome my, uh, my obsessions. I can't overcome this, Lord. I'm coming to the cross. I need to build an altar on the threshing floor. I've been getting beat up. Lord, I need your mercy. We need your mercy this morning, oh God. Reach down and touch each and every person in this place. Father, allow your spirit, allow the spirit of God just to move and breathe. Make us new creatures. Cleanse us, oh God. Cleanse us in your righteousness. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would give us a measure of your spirit. Father, help us be witnesses. God, not only with what we say, but with how we live. I want to ask this morning, if you feel like you want to build your altar on your threshing floor, just for a minute, if you would come, that maybe we could pray with you. That we could, if you need, if you've heard this message this morning, and, and you just say, you know what, I'm, I've been getting beat up, and I need, I need to build an altar. I need, I need, I need to worship God this morning. Won't you just come and stand? We're just going to pray. We're just going to pray. If you need prayer, if anybody needs prayer. Please.